Um, are you all ready now, Matteo? Oh, really? Are we ready? Are you ready? Oh, I am. Are you? I'm ready. <laughs> uh, oh, I should have got a selfie of that. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Let's, oh. do, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, I don't have the phone. I don't have the phone. <laughs> Somebody take a picture. <laughs> so, Matteo, Matteo is from Platformatic. And yes, he's going to be talking to us about network network what? HTTP. Okay, hi everyone. I am. Oh. Hello. Okay, so um, we are going to talk to do some uh, weird stuff today. Um, stuff that we are, of course, running in production and platformatic. So you know, it's it's working. Okay. So um, first of all, let's start. Do you like monoliths? Yes. You all like monoliths. Hey, this is the guy that everybody likes monoliths. Okay, so you like and the MVC pattern, right? Do you? Well, the MVC pattern tells you that if you're developing software, you are either writing a model, a view, or a controller, right? You write them in three boxes. And I made the joke so many times that I'm a little bit tired of it. And you know, soon you have 2,000 models in your models folder. And your code takes one minute and plus to load and start. And nobody can understand how that code base works at all because you have developed a nice spaghetti bowl. And I love carbonara, by the way. One of my favorite dishes. OK. So um, if you are writing monoliths and you love monoliths, you know that the solution is called microservices. And is it? <laughs> It's, 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 it's fantastic. Okay, microservice is a fantastic thing to solve the logistical complexity of building software uh, as a team with a lot of people and a lot of money to burn. That's, that's the point, right? You know, you want to go fast and have multiple teams working independently on their own thing, deploying auto autonomously and doing all sorts of shenanigans. Yes, microservice is the right technology for you, costs a lot of money. Okay? You can go very fast because you can have as many teams as you want, but you, it costs a lot of money. So, you know, can we have something in between those two things? Okay, can, this is the only thing that we can do to, do to scale our software and make sure it works. Um, well, you know, uh, I already covered this a little bit. There is a nice article from Shopify if you are looking for it, uh, talking about the, this problem. So. Uh, what a lot of other people call it, the so-called modular monolith. What is a modular monolith is? I, I was really looking for a picture for this, and I forgot to ask uh, ChatGPT. So next time, I will, I, I'll put this, replace this slide with a, with a ChatGPT-generated uh, image. OK. So the modular monolith. Uh, what does the modular monolith do? It tells you you have your uh, HTTP framework and you split it across a features domain that communicate with each other, and they are somewhat isolated, okay? So that you could potentially split your application up, move them up and down, and have multiple teams working independently. And this scales more or less indefinitely if you want to be, mostly because it's modular, right? It's, uh, uh, it doesn't, it, you don't have three boxes in which you put your code. It has as many features and domains as you have in your app. So um, taking a little bit of, uh, of lingo from the domain-driven design world, it's, uh, um, you know, domain refers to the specific subject that the project is being developed for, okay? So you can have your, I don't know, cart domain or your inventory or your catalog or your, I don't know, billing. How many of you like developing billing software? Okay, this is a good, good audience, okay. So, um, so what does a modular monolith look like? Well, you have like some kind of a lot of micro apps, more or less independently with each other, that you can use to build your own things. Okay, so uh, it's uh, it's great, works fantastic. By the way, you can use Fastify if you want to, but it's a topic of another talk. Um, so yeah, the the problem here. So we have a problem. Okay, we want to do modular monoliths, right? And I also want to have uh, communication with those with those modules. And then I have a problem. Because how do those modules communicate with each other? Do they call functions? Do you put a queue in the middle? 
do you do what? How do you? How do they communicate? How does the communication work? How can I avoid side effects? How can I make sure that my project can be moved from one spot? Uh, like I can take one module and essentially turn it into a microservice when I want to, when I want it to be. Why? Because, why do I want to do that? Well, because you know what? Now I really want the complexity of microservices, okay? Because I kind of need them. So how can we do that? Okay. Uh, HTTP is the best standard interface that we got. And very recently, there was a major change. I don't know how many of you watch this, the RFC space, but there was a major change in the HTTP RFC. Uh, RFC 91110, get out. I don't know if you have followed, but it basically uh, uh, marked as obsolete all the previous RFCs of HTTP 1 and 2, and said there is HTTP, it uh, uh, has uh, some defined semantics, and then there are the transports. Okay, so the semantics are identical across the transports. Oh, wait a second. So, does this mean that you know I can create an HTTP HTTP uh, implementation with you know, HTTP semantics uh, right on top of anything. Why not? That's more or less what this is telling me. So I can follow the uh, HTTP implementation, uh, HTTP semantics, but to be honest, I could literally use uh, whatever transport I want, and also I could potentially even use just memory and functions and maybe or maybe inter-process communication or whatever we want. So, okay, good. How can we implement this, you know? What tools do we need? Is this doable? Is this doable today? Can we do it today? Okay, how much code is it? Okay, so first of all, let's start with Undici. I've already done a talk with Undici at this conference years back. Probably a few people have known this library. If you're using anything else from doing HTTP calls, you're probably doing it wrong. Just saying. Okay, check the readme, check the benchmarks, check all the things. It's the, probably the thing that you want to use. It started as undici means 11 in Italian, so it's uh, because 1.1, 11, 11 undici also is a Stranger Things reference. And I was watching Stranger Things the first thing when I, the, the first season when I wrote this library, in a very literal sense. And now it, we just recently shipped HTTP2 support for undici. How can we call this now? Okay, okay. So that's fun. So okay, uh, Undici and uh, Undici has different APIs that you can use. You can use the basic request function, but you can also use Fetch. It's the library that powers the Fetch library in Node.js itself. It's uh, it's great. Um, Fetch is not as fast as we want to be, but is stable enough to be used. So, but if you want to work on Perf and make Fetch faster, please. There's a long issue, long discussion happening. Fetch is getting faster at every release, I'm, you know, but it's still, there's still a long way to go. So, and this is how you use Fetch from Mundici, but you can just use from Node Core and it will just work the same because it's the same build. But, you know, the version mismatch, releases, and so, and so on and so forth, you, can, you might want to use this instead of the one of Node Core if you want the latest and the greatest. Okay, so, um, how does it work underneath? Like our, we want to build networkless HTTP, right? So it means that we need to plug in into how it works internally, how it dispatches the request internally. Now, um, myself, uh, Robert Nagy and myself worked for years on the internals of this library, and it's probably super complex. Like, doing proper HTTP calls at scale is actually very, very hard. We're going to it in a second, but we have a concept of the dispatcher interface. The dispatcher interface, you know how, how it's defined? By a dispatch method. Yeah. And um, the dispatcher is, can be a global or a local, so you can even pass it as a parameter. And it specifies how the actual request. It, it's uh, completely divide the end UI, the, the UI of, uh, sorry, the developer experience of the developers with the internals. This is a, a critical difference design from the node core HTTP dot request function in which the API is tied to the internals, okay? You cannot split it. That's the reason why there is no HTTP2 dot request. You will, it will never be, it can never happen. 
because mm -hmm. the, the a public API is completely tied to the internal implementation. Okay? This is completely split. So you can have, you know, that's why we could ship fetch on top of it. You could invent a new API using just our same internals, and we do all the low level HTTP stuff. And you can just focus on the, a nice developer experience API as you want it to have. So, okay, good, a dispatcher. Okay, some more diagrams here. So, uh, what we have, we have a dispatcher, an abstract class, and then a, a dispatcher base is still abstract. You know, this is fun. And then here we have a few more things, a few more components. So let's talk, we have a client, a pool, an agent, do two kinds of pools. Why do you need two kinds of pools? Um, okay, let's go through them. So the first dispatcher abstract defines all the public methods. Okay, and they are completely empty. So they, they just, do, just do nothing. And so they, it will throw by default. And it includes, uh, I don't know, the dot request, the stream, pipeline, and so on and so forth. Good. Um, dispatcher base add more code for supporting it. Okay, um, we introduced it because we found that that, that was needed. Then um, uh, we have a few stuff. So we have the client. So this is a client is the actual and HTTP one or two a client. This this little uh, object here, it's tied to one connection. So you have one client, one connection, one socket. Okay, one client, one socket. Easy. Okay. Then you have pools, okay? Pools are a set of clients. So what does a pool do? It, if there is, a, when you want to route an HTTP request to a, to a given origin, you select the available client, it, it search for an available client, if not, it creates a new one, okay? Nice, easy, good. Why we have two kinds? We have a generic pool, which does more or less round robin. So easy, good, whatever predictable. We have a balance pool that does automatic load balancing between the different sockets that are available, uh, evaluating the latency of each one of them. So essentially, especially because if you're building a service that is, uh, it has multiple targets, you can even, you know, do load balancing uh, inside of Fundation. All of this is possible. What does an agent do? Well, an agent orchestrate multiple pools. Okay, is the one that says, given this origin, this is the pool to use. Multiple level of indirection to keep it completely boxed in and separated from the end, uh, end result. And by the way, all of these use the HTTP parser that Paolo talked about the, uh, before. So, funny. <laughs> it's as a WASM dependency. Okay, which is faster than the C++ one. And now, you know, we can start talking. Um, so, now, this system also allows for mocking requests. So Undici ship its, ships its own mocking engine. Now, this is a key difference between the, node the HTTP dot request, HTTP agent, old, old stuff, and Undici. Undici has its own mocking system, so that you don't need to, to monk, so that mocking library doesn't need to monkey patch anything for supporting node core, for, for mocking stuff. This is incredibly, thank you. This is incredibly powerful. So it doesn't need knock, okay? And if you, if you, I recommend you to take a look at the, at the shenanigans that knock needs to do. It's a phenomenal piece of engineering that allows you to mock HTTP requests uh, in all, in the, from Node Core, but also prevents Node Core from changing any of that stuff. Because if we did change the internals, we break knock, we break express, we break all the things. So, ouch. Okay, so uh, this is possible. So essentially, if you look at this, what is this? This is literally networkless HTTP, right? I am, I can, if I can mock, easily mock requests using the same API, I can implement networkless HTTP. Okay, good. So I need to write an, so in order to, to build networkless HTTP, I need to build an agent that instead of routing it to, to the mock, route it to uh, uh, my HTTP server locally or, or, or a function. Okay. So we need another module because we always need another module, right? And uh, this module called H Light My Request is uh, for from a module called Shot from API, then change it. I don't know, long story. What it does, it given a function which takes a request and a response, rack and rest, 
and it allows, which is what you put to HTTP.createServer, it allows you to inject an HTTP request, uh, 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 to dispatch an HTTP request into it. That's what it does. Again, this looks a lot like networkless HTTP. So I have a public API to do HTTP request, then another module to do injection on my HTTP server. I need to combine the two. Seems easy. Well, this does not work with Express. <laughs> and the reason why it's uh, because it replaces the request and response prototypes, and you probably shouldn't use it. But this is, you know, a long story. Um, you know, this is the guy, this is a problem, okay? Uh, and I can show you how you, sh you should, uh, we support Express, but this is a different, it's another topic. So Fastify. So I started with, uh, 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 a few months ago, or years, 2016, started working on this thing called Fastify. You probably should use this instead. And uh, um, basically, it's five million, almost six at this point, downloads per month. It's maintained by 17 people. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of plugins. So. Okay, in Fastify, you can use, uh, use light my request to do injection, which this is great for tests, so you don't need to spin up a full server, ports and so on, takes a long time. You can just do app.inject and you get your response. Hey, good. Now, this is the library that I created. It's called Fastify Undici Dispatcher, which is implemented the same dispatcher interface of Undici, but allows me to route a an HTTP request or a fetch request instead of using it from my HTTP call uh, to, uh, uh, instead of doing HTTP call, I can route it to my Fastify instance. Okay, now we are talking. Okay, I have built an HTTP, networkless HTTP engine. Great. And now let's talk about Platformatic because all this innovation I'm putting to use it somewhere. So um, Platformatic uses this uh, to streamline backend development. And essentially, if you want to move from A to B, okay, Platformatic moves you very quickly to C using a nice rail system. And then it gives you a nice SUV for your customizations to move very quickly to your end destination. Hey, cool. So, it's demo time. Demo gods. Are the, are the demo gods with me? I don't know. So, okay. So, the first thing that we are going to show you is. Uh, um, is how this works. So you, if, you, if we got uh, Fastify from Fastify, okay, is this big enough? Maybe not, okay, here we go. And we have Fastify, and then we can get uh, uh, do, 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 Fastify, Undici, Dispatcher, and then we can get um, the set global dispatcher. Great, then we can create our app. And then we can add a route. Here we go. And then we can create the Unici Dispatcher, which is not correct. Nice. Okay. And this is a, a fun one because we need to specify the domain. And yay, here we go. And then we did dispatcher.route a.local. This is completely wrong, Copilot. And then we can set the global dispatcher. And then we can, we don't want to do that. We can just do res, await, fetch. And then console log, await rest text. And let's see if this runs on the first go. Do you think it will run? If it failed. Because I did something wrong. Here we go. And. What did I do wrong? Hmm? I did something wrong. Hmm? Line 11? No, this is good. Line 15? Oh, yeah, okay, that's just the, that's the wrong stuff. Yes, true. Fine, okay. Thank, thank you. So this is specified the part of the domain. Great. So we can do node b.js and it all work fine. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, this is actually very easy to set up, create a routing system. You see that we can specify that dot local domain at the end. So you can 
actually limit the networking. That's a thing for f to get speed. If you don't do that, then you will have a few uh, performance issues down the line, especially if a domain does not exist, so you probably want to do that. Um, that's, actually, that's the only part that's actually useful. Works great. Okay, so um, how can you use this in your, why is this useful and, and so on? So let's go and uh, start doing something different, okay? Let's run uh, Create Platformatic, which is our tool to create a Platformatic app. And we create something with Platformatic Runtime. And uh, uh, yeah, here. And yes, and yes. NPM install, we are not going to deploy this right now, but there is, if you want a good video. Now we create a service called Foo, and yay, and we use TypeScript, here we go. And then we create another one called bar. And here we go. And yes, still TypeScript. And we want another service. We, this is the composer. We will assemble the two services. Here we go. And we are not using TypeScript for this guy. And here we go. And this is done. We can create a new composer, 30042, because 42 is the best number. And then we can start this. Let me show you more or less what is in these folders. So we have created three services. One, two, and three, which one single entry point, which is defined here, is the composer. What does the composer do? The composer basically tells us to route things, route requests to one service or another, and they are automatically assembled. So let's do uh, CDPLT, PLT start, and let's start this thing up. And you can see this, the TypeScript gets compiled automatically, one, two, three, and we get uh, some, some code running and our composer has all those things, those two requests, okay? Now, what is interesting is um, if I run a request, for example, with to the foo.example slash example, we, this returns the, the response from foo, but if you can see it here, we, we are only listening to one port. So everything is run within the same process and completely networkless between each other. So now, but we started the question on how we can make those services communicate with each other. They are networkless, how do we identify them? Well, it's very easy. Uh, we can do uh, push these services uh, full. We can create a client. So we can plt client runtime bar. We call it bar. And we get our client and, whoop, and then we get, we are back here. And here you can see now we have a bar folder with some, some TypeScript and OpenAPI stuff. So now in, he, in, in, our, in our routes, we can do bar. And, and I'm going to fix this in probably Fastify 5, unfortunately. And uh, then now we can do, okay, let's copy this thing. And now we can do example from bar, example bar, or maybe you can call it temple bar. And then we can do const res await request dot bar dot get example. As you can see, we have all code completion and everything already set up for us. And this is uh, from bar. And then res dot, uh, and this is just the response from that client. So we saved it. As you can see, TypeScript gets started, blah, blah, blah. Everything gets happening. Here we can see that we automatically get our route set up. And um, we can run it, and this is absolutely getting the value from bar. You might not believe it. So I'm going to bar and changing that response, which is this file, and call it hello, not conf. Well, let's call it not conf. And now if I go back here and execute it again, now you can see that it's, it says not conf. Okay, it's, it's being changed and completely restructured. Um, yay, thank you. So, um, last but not least, last year I did a release on stage. So, I am going to do a release on stage. Now, last year I ran a command, we have automated the thing. So now it's 1.10.0, and uh, uh, here we go, it's going. It's shipping, so sooner rather, and by the way, our cloud will get automatically updated, so a bunch of, I don't know, 20, 30 servers gets updated automatically after this command, so finger crossed that everything does not crash. <laughs> And uh, um, that's, uh, that's kind of it. I am almost out of time. 
So um, uh, one more thing, there is the book of Fastify, if you are interested. So authored by uh, Manuel Spigolon, Maxim uh, Sinek, and myself. I just wrote a tiny bit of it, including the, prefer the, um, the preface. And uh, uh, this is good. I also have a masterclass of managing node configuration. If you are interested on this topic, I have love it in a few, in a, in a, in a few weeks. And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matteo. Um, before we get on to questions, I actually have my phone here now. Let's do that. Oh, OK. We need to do the selfie. Here you go. Oh, that's the wrong way. Yeah. Back. Let's include them. Turn around. Awesome. Here we go. Okay. See, this is the problem. Girls just want to have pockets. We don't actually manage to fit our phones in these things. Who has a question for Matteo? Right, okay, I'm on my way. It's good to wait for the mic, because that way it'll actually be... People who are listening online can hear you. Hi, uh, my name is Armin. I'm from Germany. Hi. Um, I would have a question. Do you have some real-world experience with uh, this approach. Um, so right now in the, in the cloud-native world, you would have like 10 microservices developed by uh, 10 different teams. Um, do you have some real-world experience if they move now to uh, uh, one, one service and doing those uh, uh, work on the same app and in-app uh, communication like you showed it? So um, this is 100% dog being dog-fooded. Uh, dog Dog-food, or I don't know what was the term. So uh, we are doing, first of all, we are doing it ourselves. This is in production on our cloud. So I, uh, we fixed a lot of bugs um, on that approach. Uh, we also, this is also used in production by a few of our clients. So happy days. And uh, um, it's also an approach that you, you might have heard or not is more or less widespread at Google. And not with this technology, but with very similar uh, set of tags. And uh, they also recently published a paper on it. So I, you know, it's probably kind of where the, uh, a lot of uh, these kind of systems is, uh, is going. So I don't know. It's, uh, then you can talk about a lot about technology and implementation details. But it's, there is quite a lot of things. Uh, uh, it seems a good approach, essentially. Thank you. And it's very useful because uh, uh, you know, if you're building a microservice system, you can have, you typically spin up three different microservices, two or three different systems for each microservice. And most, in a lot of apps, this means it's, uh, most of them sits idle, because most of them are redundant for business reasons. And in this case, you can actually condense it quite significantly. And you can even use it to create preview environments very quickly, because now you can just need to spin up one container on one system instead of a full network of a Kubernetes cluster, plus Istio, Envoy, um, API gate, various kind of API gateways and stuff to test it. And running it locally is very painful, while in this system, running it locally is just uh, uh, snapping your fingers. Now, all of this is, is, is HTTP-based, so you can even just Take one of the service out, put it on a container, it just works. So you can even use it as a mixed step uh, in between. Uh, so one question that I have. So you're using a white my request under the hood, and originally it was designed basically for running tests. Yeah. So I would assume that it never was aggressively optimized for performance. So do you see the need or the space for performance optimizations on the white my request now that it's intended to be used in production as well, or is it already very fast and overhead is super low? It's already very fast. Uh, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's using, it has been used in production by quite a, a lot of companies. It's uh, uh, this, the libraries that underpins the Lambda, AWS Lambda adapter for Fastify. And you can check the benchmarks. is I don't know, an order of magnitude or something like that faster than the one that you can find for Express or other things. So I, it's... There's probably room for optimization, but it's um, relatively fast enough for, for this use case. And definitely less costly than doing a full HTTP round, HTTPS round trip with uh, 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 cryptography and all the things that you need when you do microservice. So again, let's compare it with the, the other stuff, okay? So. Okay. 
Uh, one more related to performance. Uh, is it still heating up the server room with all of the JSON serialization and deserialization? It has to. If you don't do that, if you don't do JSON, if you don't do full copy between the two things, you have uh, uh, you have a few. You, you you still need to do a, a copy system, okay? Because otherwise, an object could be mutated. So yeah. you will need to do a full. Uh, 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 a full copy, a full deep copy of the objects yeah, that would you're moving. structured clone work for that? Uh, technically, it might be possible, okay. Um, I didn't try, mostly because I want to keep the same interface on both sides, so that uh, when, when and if the, somebody wants to spin something out as a different process, they could, okay. If I started using that kind of fax, those kind of fast paths, then they will need to undo those fast paths. So I am 100% sure that at some point I will get to those things, okay? Uh, um, because uh, this seems like low-hanging fruits to get speed. But at this point in time, it's uh, um, the, uh, the composability of the system so that I can take one service, run it on one machine, one all together as, as, a, as a modular monolith, or take it and run it as a microservice next, the next day wins uh, the performance cost. Yeah. Makes me want to monkey patch JSON global anyway. <laughs> of course that you should. You should do that, okay? We can, t so um, the stuff that I showed you, uh, each one of the application is uh, um, completely uh, clean up the, um, uh, the loader's cache. So it's all based on, on the new loader system. So there is the loader cache. It's, it's get refreshed using some interesting techniques. And therefore, um, while they keep, they can have the same module dependencies to save stuff, they tend to be as clean as possible, and that's what powered the auto load. Okay, I, I know that there are more questions for Matteo, and I am afraid he is out of time. Are you kicking me out of the stage? I'm kicking you off the stage, Oh, really? Ah, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, thank you again to Matteo. Thank you, um, Great talk. So.